This week I had to go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for business, and just before I went, I picked up a rental car and stopped at a Speedway gas station. If you're familiar with Speedway gas stations, they usually have pizza or hot dogs or things out for you to eat, and it's always tempting to buy something, even if you're not hungry. But this time, there was nothing there. All the roller grills were empty. There was no pizza slices ready for you to buy. You couldn't get your own coffee. You couldn't get your own fountain drinks. It had to be pre-made or made by someone behind the counter. Things were different, and things were even worse when you looked at the different customers that were inside there. It seems like all of them were afraid to come anywhere near anybody else. If I started walking towards another place, people would step aside and get out of my way. And I felt like shouting, I didn't lick the doorknob, please, come on! You know, it, sometimes people go crazy trying to protect themselves. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe not. Now, you might think that we have a weird situation now with the coronavirus, uh, as it's been harming a lot of people worldwide, and the social distancing is something that we're still getting used to. But imagine that there are other times when things have been like that before. In fact, the biblical story we're going to look at today actually has someone that people distanced themselves from. Let's take a look. Uh, Mark 5 Verses 1 through 5 will begin the story. Let me read. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could any one tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. As we go through the events in this biblical real event that happened during Jesus' ministry, I want you to consider how the presence of Jesus affected a variety of individuals. And at the end, we'll make some application. Our first point is a proper description of someone without Jesus, a proper description of someone without Jesus. As you read through that account in these first five verses, it's clear that the person writing was writing from an eyewitness account, or he had heard from someone who had been there and was writing this out, someone who was familiar with what actually happened. Now, as we go through this description, I want you to notice the terrible condition of this man. His life had been lived entirely apart from a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it showed. First of all, he was possessed. As the boat landed on the eastern shore of Galilee, Jesus disembarked from the boat and was immediately met by a demon-possessed man. Yikes! You've heard stories about demon-possessed people, and uh, hopefully none of you have ever come in contact with that. I have met people who have, and it's a, a very fearful thing. Here, this man, he was possessed. Now, what does the Bible say about demon possession? The Bible gives us several examples of people who were possessed by demons. First Samuel 16, now this was not a possession, but King Saul was oppressed by a demon. He had turned away from the Lord, rebelled against him after being a good king for a short period of time. And so he was oppressed, he was depressed, and he was angry. During Jesus' ministry, there were times when he healed people who were possessed by demons. They caused their victims to be mute, blind, to convulse, fall into the water or fire. Many bad things. Luke 22 talks about Satan possessing Judas as he went to betray Jesus on that terrible night. Acts 16 talks about a slave girl who was able to tell fortune somehow being possessed by demons. And then in this chapter, we read about a man who was possessed and had superhuman strength, able to break the shackles that were on him. It's apparent that demon-possessed people are controlled, not only by demons, but they have strange powers, and usually harmful things happen to that person. Now, note that, that not all of the characteristics that I have mentioned, depression, uh, convulsions, blindness, being mute, things like that. Not all of those are 
uh, are, are attributed to someone who is possessed by a demon. Some of those have natural means as well. But on the other hand, a lot of times those of us in America look past what Satan has done in the past and forget that he can do it today as well. So uh, it's not a good thing. A second thought is how does someone become possessed by a demon? We're not told exactly how someone opens himself or herself to demon possession, but it often seems to have involved uh, someone who has turned from the right way, someone who has habitually been in a sinful practice. In the case of Judas, he had been greedy. He had been stealing money from the common purse. Uh, Saul had turned away from what was right and was depressed, and he was hindered by this evil spirit. So a lot of times demon possession came because sin had become such a prominent part in that person's life. So he was possessed by demons. The second thing is he was an outcast. He was an outcast of society. As you read through the strange description of this man, you can see his actions would have caused people to put him out of the city. Why is that man shrieking in your house? Get him out of here. And so he lived outside the city, somewhere along the, the tombs that were cut into the hillside. Now, that part of the uh, country by the Sea of Galilee is known for the rock formations and the caves. And oftentimes the people would use the caves for burying their dead. And this is the place where this man lived as an outcast of society. A third thing about him was he was uncontrollable. Uh, the word used to describe him in the Greek language is damazo, which means to tame a wild animal. Imagine the uh, someone trying to tame a horse that had never had a rider before. Here was a man who they had put fetters on his feet and chains on his hands or other parts of his body, and they could not hold him back. With abnormal strength, he would just break those chains apart and be free from them. This was a man who was possessed by a demon, and he was uncontrollable. The fourth thing about him is he was miserable. Notice in verse 5 what it says, that he was crying and cutting himself with stones. He went about night and day, shrieking wildly and cutting himself with sharp stones. Imagine what that must have been like to watch. Uh, little children were kept indoors when they heard this man shrieking at night. And then to see him cutting himself, uh, taking sharp stones and slashing his arms and his body till the blood had come out. Another account in one of the other Gospels says that this man was also without his clothes. That must have added to the strangeness. Imagine this unearthly yelling man running around amongst the tombs with no clothes on. Do you get a good picture of demon possession? I would say no. Everything that describes this man is not good. And that's the way Satan is. He always promises something good, some temptation, something that will bring happiness, and yet it doesn't. Demon possession always leads to something that destroys a person. This man was in a terrible condition. He was wounded, controlled by whatever strange actions the demons wanted him to do, and he was miserable. Here is the description of a man and what he is like when he doesn't know Jesus. You know, without Jesus, each of us is in a similar and terrible situation. If you've been saved from your sin by Jesus, you can look back at your past and recall how bad your life was. Someone without Jesus is possessed with a nature that will fight against God, that doesn't want what he wants. You look back on your past, someone without Jesus is outside, cast out of God's good will. Before you became a Christian, you were unwilling to submit your will to God's will. And then you were miserable in your sinful life without Jesus. There's always that longing that can never be satisfied, that you never could have. And that's a proper description of someone, someone's life without Jesus. Now let's take a look at the next few verses. Mark 5, beginning in verse 6, we'll read through verse 13. 
When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Our second point is a proper respect for Jesus. A proper respect for Jesus. When the demon-possessed man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran to him to meet him. What a crazy experience that must have been for the disciples. Did they jump out to protect the master, or did they hide back in the boat? Uh, it's uh, what, a, what an interesting thing. But a proper respect for Jesus. Now, what is the first thing we see in these verses? We see worship. Oh, wait a minute. Where did that come from? Worship? A demon-possessed person worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, what does worship mean? Worship is, in the English language, showing reverence, adoration, or honor. So someone can worship someone without necessarily agreeing with them. Uh, but first of all, as we look at this, worship involves knowledge. Worship involves knowledge. The demons knew who Jesus was. Remember, demons are fallen angels. When Satan rebelled against God and wanted to be like the Most High God. He wanted to take God's place on the throne. He convinced some of the angels to go along with him, and so God kicked out a large portion of the angels that followed him, all of those that followed him. Now, imagine what this must have been like, these demons who knew who Jesus was, and then they see their Creator standing before them. Have you ever disobeyed an authority and then found out that they were watching you the whole time? That would be very awkward, wouldn't it? This is how they felt. They had been caught in the act. When Jesus arrived, the demons were caught in their sin by someone who they knew, whom they knew to be God Almighty. They knew who he was. But the other part of it is that Jesus knew who they were. Have you ever considered the fact that Jesus knew the name of every one of the demons that possessed this man? They were angels that had been in heaven with him, whom he had known from, from their creation. So he knew every one of their names. And as their God and creator, Jesus knew exactly who they were and what they were doing. So why did they worship him? Well, worship involves knowledge, but the second thing is that worship is not always sincere. Worship is not always sincere. When you think of the word worship, what do you usually think of? You think of people in a service praising God, singing songs, talking about how great he is. However, in this case, the demons were not doing that at all. They were simply bowing before the one who could cast them out of this man and judge them. Uh, maybe this illustration would help you understand what they were doing. Imagine a criminal standing before a judge. He's not repentant of his sin. He doesn't care about the family of the person he has murdered, etc. But he's very respectful and says, yes, your honor, no, your honor, etc. to the, the judge. Why? Why is he doing that? Because he wants a favorable outcome. So worship is not always sincere, but they did show worship. Now, the second thing we see in verses 7 through 13 is pleading. They pled with Jesus that he would not send them away. They didn't want to go to the ultimate destruction in the lake of fire. They didn't want Jesus to torture them earlier than their time or what they thought was their time. Matthew twenty five forty one speaks about Jesus there is, is giving an example, and he says, The everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And when you think of hell or the lake of fire, you think of a place that was prepared for Satan and those who followed him and left heaven. The original purpose for the lake of fire was a punishment for Satan and his angels. And they didn't want to go there. 
Instead, they wanted to enter a herd of pigs. This seemed to be quick thinking on their part to get out of trouble all of a sudden. But for those of us who know our Bibles a little bit, uh, we may have a question. Why were there pigs in this area? Wasn't Jesus ministering to the lost sheep of Israel, to the Jewish people? Yes, he was. So why were there pigs in this area? Uh, the law, Leviticus, excuse me, Leviticus 11.7, 7, uh, considered pigs to be unclean and something that could not be eaten by the Jewish people by law. <clears throat> well, this was an area where many Gentiles lived. So this is an opinion. I can't prove it, but perhaps there were some renegade Jewish people who were willing to disobey the law in order to make a tidy profit. You know, there have been people of any race who have uh, been okay with disobeying God in order to make money. So perhaps that was the case here. So why did Jesus let them enter the pigs? We see that Jesus immediately gave them permission to do that. Perhaps he was trying to teach, if my theory is correct, if he was trying to teach renegade Jews that God was not pleased with their disobedience, he allowed them to go into the pigs and then teach them a lesson. So what happened to the pigs? When the demons left the man, they immediately entered the pigs, the whole herd of them, and about 2,000 in number stampeded down into the lake and drowned themselves. Wow. Must have been a crazy thing to see. So, <clears throat> in this section, the demons had a proper respect for Jesus because they knew who Jesus was and what authority he had. Now, if you were to describe your level of respect for Jesus, what would you say? Many people look at Jesus as a, uh, a nice teacher, sort of like a professor at college or a well-known preacher they might see on television. But do you recognize who Jesus really is and the honor that he deserves? Do you realize that he is the one who has the power to save you or to cast you into the lake of fire? A proper response to Jesus is important, but it has to be based on proper knowledge of who he is. <clears throat> First of all, Jesus is God. Do you realize that Jesus is not just a man who lived and died a long time ago? He is the divine Son of God, God who became a man. And that's the second thing about him. He is a man. He is God, but he became man. Uh, John talks about him uh, the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. So he is a man. He left the throne of heaven to live among us. He interacted with us. He interacted well below his dignity, dignity so he could communicate truth and love to us and God's will. Third thing about him is he's the Savior. Jesus is the one who came to die for the sins of the world. He willingly gave his life on the cross, bleeding and dying instead of us. He took our place on the cross. He's also the judge. Jesus rose from being dead three days after his death. He ascended into heaven some days later after being seen by over 500 people. And he's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God the Father. And at the end of time, he will be the one who judges all who have rejected him at the great white throne judgment. You can read, read about that in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15. All those who refuse to repent of their sin and believe in him will be cast into the lake of fire. So my question to you is, should you perhaps have a different type of respect for Jesus? Not one like the demons had, uh, where they just knew who he was and then gave him feigned uh, homage, feigned uh, worship. But maybe you ought to be the one who realizes who Jesus is and you turn to him for mercy. Now let's look at our third point. We'll look at verses 14 through 20. Verse 14 says, So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, sitting unclothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he has had compassion on you. 
And he departed and began to proclaim unto Capulus all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Our third point is this, a proper response to Jesus, a proper response to Jesus. At this point in the account, we see several responses to Jesus. First of all, the people were terrified. You see that in these first verses. The people watching the, the pigs, when they ran down into the sea, they were terrified. They go into the city and they tell the people, and they're terrified as well. And honestly, wouldn't you have responded the same way, not knowing the situation, not knowing that it was Jesus who would cause this? Of course you would. So the people were terrified. Uh, the report, the herdsmen went to the city and reported what had happened. The people were probably skeptical. Now imagine if you were in charge of watching a hundred cars in a parking lot and you run to your boss with this frightened look on your face and you said i don't know what happened but all a hundred cars just drove out of the parking lot now what do you think the boss would say about that he'd say sure let's go look at the parking lot have you been uh drinking or been on drugs or something yeah, so that's probably how the people responded, with skepticism. But when they finally came and saw the bodies of the pigs floating in the water, 2,000 of them, and also saw this demon-possessed man no longer possessed, there he was, clothed and in his right mind, self-controlled, and much different than he was before. They were terrified. So what was their response? Did they immediately fall at his feet and, and call out to Jesus to save them from their sins? No. Just as people right now are concerned about the economic impact of the, uh, the coronavirus and staying home, so these people were worried about the economic loss. That was their major concern. And instead of trying to ask questions and find out what the problem was and what had happened, they said, please, leave. Go away from us. Get out of our land. We don't want you here. Economically, you can understand their concern. But they were short-sighted in their response. Now, a different response is found by the man who had been demon-possessed. He loved Jesus. The man loved Jesus. We see that in verse 18. It says, And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. The man loved Jesus. He begged Jesus. This is the same word about that the demons used. They were pleading with Jesus. Here he is pleading with Jesus to be with him. And, and what does that mean that he wanted to be with him? It means the same thing that it meant in chapter 3 verse 14 where Jesus was describing what he wanted, what his purpose was for the 12 disciples, that they would be with him. So this man was saying, I want to be your disciple. I want to be one, like one of the 12 and be with you. But Jesus, for a reason that we'll see just in a moment, had a different idea. He refused this idea of making this man his disciple right now. Jesus had something different in mind. Jesus told him to go back to his home and his people, his family, and tell them what God had done for him and how God had showed mercy on him. So that's what he did. And the next thing is the man praised Jesus wherever he went. We see that in verses 19 and 20. He proclaimed what Jesus did for him. Uh, the two things that Jesus said for him to do was show people what great things the Lord has done for you. So you've been healed. You've been had the demons cast out of you. And then show how the Lord has had compassion on you. You know, of all the people that were demon-possessed during that time, and I don't know how many there were, but all the needy people in that area, thousands or perhaps even a million people who lived back then, I don't know. Jesus had mercy on this man, this hopeless man. What a wonderful person the Lord is. So he proclaimed what Jesus did for him, and he proclaimed it in the whole area. Now, this, this city in which he lived was part of a league of ten Greek cities. All of them, except for one, were on the east side of the Jordan. And he went to this. It was called the Decapolis. You know, the Decathlon, the Ten Events. Well, these were ten cities. So in the Decapolis, he proclaimed the wonderful things that Jesus had done for him. And the response of the people was they were amazed. The word there means they were astonished at what he said. Now, 
Isn't it amazing when you hear the testimony of somebody who has been saved from great wickedness, a man who was on death row and God somehow saved that man's life. Someone who was a drunkard living, uh, lying in the gutter. Someone who was involved in so many affairs and then God saved his life. Someone who was a wicked person and God saved him. Isn't that an astonishing thing to hear? But it's a wonderful thing to hear. Now, the response of the people uh, reminds us of something that we need to think about. What is our response to Jesus today? You could have a short, uh, short-sighted short response. The townspeople were terrified. They were concerned about the economic loss that they were having. But for some reason, they wanted nothing to do with Jesus. That was short-sighted. The second response is better and one that maybe we should have, we should have, and that is a grateful response. This grateful man who had been delivered from his wicked lifestyle and and having been possessed by demons, he was so thankful for what Jesus had done that he told everybody about it. That was a proper response. Now, in conclusion, many of us have had the same response as the demon-possessed man. Although, probably, none of us were possessed by demons, we do remember our days living in sin and regret how we, we acted and how we thought. But now we're so thankful to God for what he did for us through Jesus. When someone repents of their sin and puts their faith in Christ, a miraculous change happens. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Another verse I think of is in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Paul says these words, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he concludes with this, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, today is not a time to dredge up your past. It's not us wanting to know all that you used to be. But as you think about what God has done for you, you can thank him with a mighty shout of thanksgiving and a hallelujah. We who have been born again through faith in Christ, we can gratefully proclaim what a great difference God has made in our lives and the mercy that he had on us. We have been changed, just like the demon-possessed man. Now, for those who have not been changed by Jesus as of yet, I imagine that you've seen the change in the lives of, of some Christians. Perhaps you've seen the change in my life, if you know me, or someone else that you know. Please take a moment and listen to that person's true life story of how he was changed by Jesus, and consider how great things Jesus can do for you as well. See, it's not something that Christians want to hold on to just for ourselves. We want everyone to have the peace that passes all understanding. We want everyone to have forgiveness of sins, to know the Lord, to have the joy that he can give, the love and peace that he offers. You know, many people have the misery that this man had before he met Jesus. Yet Jesus gave him hope. You know, Jesus can give you hope as well. I remember when I was traveling on a ministry team in college some 20 years ago, Someone called the church we were at, and we happened to be the only ones there, so we talked to a person who was suicidal. And we told that person how Jesus could give them hope. And for that person, it was, it was very difficult, the thing that were, they were going through. But the truth is that Jesus can give hope, and it's only found in him. A lot of people have longing for wanting to be included, or they're lonely, and, and they want something, and the thing that they are missing is Jesus himself. He's the one that can give them the satisfaction that they need. Now think about that. The creator of the universe is Jesus. He's the one who created your body. And the only one who knows what will satisfy you is the one who made you. Jesus can change your life. But before your life can be changed, you have to recognize a few things. Number one, recognize who Jesus is. Jesus is God, became man. 
who died for you and rose again so that you could be saved. Secondly, recognize who you are. You're a sinner who's condemned according to God's perspective. And you will spend eternity in the lake of fire unless you come to Jesus, repent of your sin, and put your faith in him. And that's the third thing. After recognizing who Jesus is, recognizing who you are, you must repent of your sin and put your whole trust in him alone. I want you to note something, and if you don't remember anything else, remember this. The same Jesus who changed the life of this hopelessly lost, demon-possessed man, he can do the same for you.